Hi folks, it's Mr. Martin, and I want to talk to you about how to photograph art documents and photos. But before we get started, there's something I want to talk to you about. If you have the option, use a tripod. A tripod eliminates all kinds of problems that happen when you handhold the camera. For instance, camera shake, uh, which can cause out of focus pictures. It can cause your framing to be a little bit wrong. And you know, Especially if you're trying to do this by yourself, it's nice to be able to have your camera in a stable spot so that you have hands free. Using a tripod will make a world of difference in terms of your frustration level, especially. Now, if a tripod isn't an option, rest your camera or your phone on a table. You can stack books, you can use other, you know, stable things to rest your camera on when you're taking your shots. And this will give you that stability that you would get out of a tripod. Um, and it, you know, of course it costs nothing because, you know, a lot of people don't have tripods hanging around. Although ask your parents, ask your family members, look around because you might be surprised what's available. But anyway, if you don't have a tripod using a table and some sturdy objects is really helpful, you know, but the thing about it is, especially with a phone, um, a phone won't stand up on its own. So you can't walk away from it. So what's another option as a substitute to a tripod? Well, the internet is full of solutions for camera stands for your phone that cost nothing. And so here's a great example of someone using a coffee cup as a camera stand. So I'm gonna put some links below the video so that you can go out there and find some options for you. But trust me when I tell you, there are plenty of hacks out there. So here we go, how to photograph art documents and photos. So there are some key ideas in what's called copy work. Copy work is, uh, you know, photographing art, documents, and photographs. And it's actually a whole industry. There are people that this is what they do all day long. The key concepts are even light, sharp focus, accurate exposure. If you don't know what that means, we're going to get to it. And minimized lens distortion. I want to talk about that before we get to the end because the end of the presentation is where lens distortion is. And I just want to say that all camera lenses distort the image a little bit. Some of them do it quite a lot. So if you've ever been to a hotel and you've looked through the little peephole in the door, you know, somebody knocks on the door, you'll notice that you can see both ends of the hallway, even though, you know, the wall is only, you know, is right across the hallway from you. So how is it that the, that the image is bent so much that even though you're looking straight out the door, you can see way to the right and way to the left? Well, the lens has such a curvature to it that it's actually bending and distorting the light. Um, and if somebody were to be on the other side of that peephole and be looking right at you, their head would look really large, but the rest of their body down at the floor level would look like it was really small, really far away. And it's a sort of a weird, what they would call a forced perspective look. And that's because the lens in that particular application, that kind of lens really bends the image a lot. Well, there are camera lenses that bend the image that much, but most of the time lens distortion isn't even really noticeable unless you have something to compare it to, like say a work of art. You're looking at the original work of art and then you're looking at your photograph that you took with your smartphone or your camera and you're noticing something just looks a little odd. And a lot of times that's lens distortion. Sometimes we can do some, uh, some things to minimize that, but you know, generally speaking, you're dependent on the lens and the lens can only do what it can do. So we do have to make some little sacrifices there in terms of lens distortion quality. Anyway, we're going to move on. So even light, even means the same amount of light is falling on all parts of your subject, in this case, your artwork. So if the light isn't even, you're going to see hot and cold spots, which are really bright areas and, you know, darker areas. Even light does not look like what you're seeing in this photograph. So you'll notice that there's a really bright spot on one side and then it falls off into a darker area on the other side. So let's talk math for a second. So how light fall off works is that um, at a certain distance, the light, we'll call it intensity, we'll give it a, an algebraic um, 
uh, character, the light at a certain distance is X. And when you go twice that distance, the light isn't you know half X, it's actually the square root of X. So that's a lot less light. Now, why does this matter so much? Well, it matters because, you know, when you're setting up your lights to photograph your artwork, they're probably only going to be a few feet away. So from one side of an image to the other is a relatively long distance compared to how far away the lights are. So when you, when it's, when that's the situation, you can actually perceive a real difference in the light from one side of the image to the other. So you put your light next to your artwork and it's shining down on the artwork kind of in the center, but the side of the artwork that's closest to the light is still getting more light. And the side that's further away is getting less light. And so, and, and actually when the light's only a few feet away, you can really perceive that difference. So there's a solution. And what is the solution? Simplest thing ever, use two lights. So if you have two equally powered lights, you know, two equal power light bulbs and the lights are the same distance away from the artwork. If you put one on one side, put one on the other side and you can kind of balance your light and that'll give you that even lighting. Now here's a tip that isn't in the presentation here, but it's something that's really important to know. We can't always perceive a lighting difference with our eyes. Our eyes are connected to this brain computer we have, and it makes adjustments so that everything looks great. But if we were to photograph it, it might not look that great. And so what I would tell you is set up your two lights so that you think everything looks good and that your art has nice, even lighting on it. But then take a test photo and see if you need to adjust your lights again, because you might find that you have a hot spot and a cold spot that you didn't really perceive with your eyes, but you can definitely see it in the photograph. So that's how you get even lighting. Make sure the lights are the same distance, that they're slightly closer to the subject than your camera is um, or your phone is, because if the lights say that, you know, your you've got your artwork on the wall, you've got a table in front of it, you've got your smartphone you're holding, you're getting ready to take your picture, and the lights are slightly behind you on the artwork, well, there's a chance that you could actually cast your own shadow on the artwork. So try to get the lights out of the picture, but closer to the artwork than the camera is. Here's a professional copy setup, okay? now. You can't necessarily do all of this, but maybe you can do some of it. Um, some examples that you see at the top there, you'll see that where it says in the top right, it says black velvet. What they've done is they've got black velvet, which is a cloth that really does not reflect any light, up on the wall or on the table surface, depending on whether you're shooting your art flat on a table or up on the wall. Why, why do they have that black velvet up there? So that your copy lights don't cause light to be bouncing around the room. Um, notice that they have glass on top of the artwork. The rectangle at top, the long, thin, white rectangle represents the artwork. And then you'll notice that they have a thin rectangle that's got kind of diagonal hash marks in it. And that's a piece of glass. I don't recommend that you use a piece of glass over your artwork if you can help it. It does make the artwork flatter, and that's the benefit of it. But the, um, the problem with it is that glass, of course, reflects things and it can create all kinds of problems with getting other reflections in your artwork. Notice that the lights are set up. Each one's at 45 degree angle to the artwork and that the camera's in the center. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, it says black cards and they're sort of set up and at an angle to the camera in between the lights and the camera. And then it says, then it's got a horizontal line with two little, I don't know what you'd even call those, three lines at each end. Um, and it says black cloth. Now, if you have the option to shoot through a black cloth, like a cloth with a hole in it or a piece of black cardboard, that's great. But we'll talk more about that later. But this is sort of the general setup, whether you're shooting down on a table, and so that glass and the subject at the top are sitting on a table surface and you're shooting straight down, or if you hang it on a wall and you're shooting it on the wall, that's either way, this is kind of what the setup 
should look like. So glare, I talked about this just a second ago with reflections. Uh, when you're shooting, darken the rest of the room. Everywhere that doesn't, that is not in front of those lights that you're using should be darker. So don't shoot next to an open window. Don't shoot with a window behind you. Um, as you can see, this photographer was shooting and like there's a, they must have been shooting outside and the whole background is brighter. And so now you can see the photographer. But you can imagine, see how dark the photographer looks? It, you can imagine if the background behind the photographer was also dark, you wouldn't see any of that. So this can also happen in a room and you just need to be aware of it. And this especially happens if you're shooting framed artwork that's got glass on it or if you decide to use a piece of glass on top of your artwork to flatten it. So just be aware of that. And one way to do it, as we talked about before, and you can see in the bottom there, right by the camera, you can use a black cloth with a hole cut through it, or you can use a piece of cardboard that's uh, black or very dark with a hole cut through it, and that'll be really helpful. Uh, but generally speaking, if you don't use glass, you don't have the problem to the degree that you see here in the illustration. So there is a super easy, super cheap solution. It doesn't work every single day of the year, but it works many days. And that is to take your artwork outdoors on an overcast day, a very cloudy day. Obviously, taking artwork out on a day when it's raining, bad idea. But if it's not raining and it's very cloudy, cloud clouds are very even light. And I want you to think about how that works, right? So we've got, when you've got clouds, you've got these semi-transparent white water vapor up in the air covering the whole sky. So the bright, bright light hits the back of the clouds from the sun and underneath the clouds where we are, it lights up the whole sky, all the clouds light up very, very evenly. So it suddenly goes from being a point light source like the sun, which casts a lot of shadows, to being the entire sky is now the, the light source. And that's very, very even. So if you notice on a really cloudy day, maybe you never noticed, but look down. On a very cloudy day, you really don't have much by way of shadows that are very minimized. Well, that's ideal for photographing artwork. So you can use an easel if you have that. You can put your art on the ground. I would recommend that you know you put a piece of cardboard that's you know larger or a board down and put your artwork down on it. Or you can hang it up on a fence or uh, on a wall. You can ask an assistant to hold it for you and you can crop out the background later. So you can see there that that's exactly what I did here. I have a photograph of someone um, holding a piece of art and then I've cropped out the background and you can see it's a you know pretty good photo. So focus. I don't mean you. I mean focus on the artwork. Blurry is not okay at all. Sharp focus is a minimal expectation. Okay. Um, sharp focus in photography. It is not. It is not something that we mess around with. You, it's either a good photo that's in focus or it's an out of focus and therefore bad photo, especially when we're talking about copy work. So autofocus, it is a thing that you have if you're using your camera and most modern cameras have it, or when you're using your smartphone, you're using autofocus, automatic focus. And when you're shooting photos of action, autofocus is like the greatest thing ever. You know, you're at a party, um, somebody's blowing out the candles on the cake, you can pull your smartphone out, quick point it at them and take a picture and you're pretty sure it's gonna be in focus, right? So that's great, but there are times when autofocus really stumbles. Autofocus in macro photography, which is close-up photography and especially when we're doing what's called copy work, photographing art or photos or documents, um, autofocus can really struggle with this. Autofocus uses contrast. In other words, areas of light and dark and lines to focus. So, you know, your camera sees a line that 
should be nice and sharp and it looks fuzzy and it goes, oh, I need to sharpen that and it changes its focus. Well, your artwork does not always have that. And so that can really confuse the camera. So what do you do? Well, here's what I do. Um, and you've got to know two things. One thing you've got to know, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, is how to lock your focus, especially on a smartphone. But one of the first things that I do if I'm going to be doing copy work is that I go on Google and I do a search for a focus chart and then I print it out. Um, and if you're at school, uh, come see me and we can find one and print one out for you. So a focus chart is just this thing that uh, we, you can print out and put in the place where you're going to take your artwork photos and your camera can very easily lock in its focus. And so there's an example of a focus chart right there. And that will help your camera lock in its focus. So you put your artwork down or you put your artwork up on the wall and then you put the focus chart over it, have somebody hold it, whatever, and then you lock your focus. But if you don't know how to lock your focus, then maybe you got a little problem. So here's the deal on that. Almost every camera, whether it be part of your smartphone or whether it's an actual DSLR or some other digital camera, they have something called a focus lock. And they also have what's called an exposure lock. And I told you we would get into that in a little bit here. So what that does is it locks the focus on whatever your subject is. And once it's locked, it doesn't matter if anything changes. You know, if somebody walks between the camera and the artwork, it's not going to try to refocus. So you put that focus chart down and you lock your focus on the focus chart. And then when you take your focus chart away, it will be exactly focused where the artwork's going to be. So exposure. Talk about focus lock and also exposure lock. So what is exposure? Exposure is the, is the amount of light coming into the camera and striking the sensor where the image is made. And um, exposure is one of those things where there's kind of, there's a right and wrong on exposure, but sometimes as artists, photographers will manipulate that right and wrong for effect. But when you're doing copy work, you really just want an exact exposure. So how do you do that? Because what will happen is if you don't have enough light, you'll lose contrast and sharpness. Um, if you have too much light, you'll have too much contrast. In other words, your darks will be too dark and your lights will be too light. So we don't want something overexposed and we don't something, want something underexposed. So how do you fix that? Well, you use something called a gray card. Um, it's called an 18% gray card, but you may not have access to this. So if you don't have a gray card, it just so happens that um, a dollar bill, the back of a dollar bill, the mixture of the dark ink and the light paper together is roughly 18% gray. So if you lock your exposure on a dollar bill, you're going to get roughly the same as if you had a nice 18% gray card to hold up. So let's talk about distortion. I talked about it before, but here's some examples, right? So on the far right, that's like if you're looking through the hotel door through the peephole. Okay, that lens is extremely distorted. And if you look at this gentleman, his nose appears very big, his head appears skinny, his eyes appear a little bit large, but you'll notice the top of his head, just it just looks a little crazy, okay? And as you start to go to the left, each one of these lenses is a little less distorted, okay? So 12 millimeter, he doesn't look quite, his nose isn't quite as big, his face is starting to get wider, his eyes look a little smaller relative to the size of his head, 16 millimeter, by the way, is still significant distortion, but it looks a lot more the way we would see things. And, you know, if you're looking at that, you might not even notice um, that anything was um, distorted at all. 35 millimeter is, you know, not bad. Um, it, it appears pretty normal. And then the, to the left of that, that's an 85 millimeter lens which is called a portrait lens. And you'll notice that that looks the best of all of them. So here's the thing. You, the, if you're using your phone or you're using most what they call point and shoot digital cameras, the 35 millimeter lens is probably what you're 
most likely going to have access to. So it's something right around there. Why, why is that, by the way? Because the lens on your camera, on your phone, on your point and shoot camera has to be something that will work for most situations. And a lot of times photographs are being taken indoors in relatively tight spaces. So if you have a slightly wider angle, angle lens, like a 35 millimeter, that allows, you know, that allows you to get a little bit more of the room. Not ideal for copy work, but it's one of those limitations that I, I mentioned, you know, it's a sacrifice we have to make. So here's a really important thing that is related to the lens, but it really has much more to do with you. Okay, keystoning. And keystoning is 100% operator error when you see it. So if you look down at that image at the bottom, let's look in the center. That's our artwork, and that's how we want it to look. We want it to look like a rectangle. But if you look to the left, you'll see, oh, here it is with the top being very wide and the bottom being very narrow. And if you look to the right, it's the opposite. The bottom's very wide and the top's very narrow. And although I don't have examples of this, this could be true with the left and the right as well. So here's what's happening. In the center photo, the one that we want, the camera is exactly parallel to the artwork. Neither the top nor the bottom of the camera is tilted closer to the artwork. Neither the left nor the right of the camera is tilted closer to the artwork. If you look at the image on the left, that happens when the top of the camera is a little bit closer to the artwork than the bottom of the camera. Because it's closer, you know, things that are closer appear to be bigger. And so because the camera is tilted so that the top of the camera is closer to the artwork than the bottom, now the top of the artwork appears bigger because of the, the tilt of the camera. And to the right, that's the same, except that the bottom of the camera is tilted out as opposed to the top. So we want to avoid that. We want to try to keep that camera nice and parallel to your artwork. Um, there's an example of the fisheye distortion. You know, it's kind of fun when it's two kids at the mall, but uh, not so fun when it's your artwork. So in a DSLR, which is a camera with interchangeable lenses, this is an easy fix. You just get a different lens, right? On your, um, your built-in lens cameras, such as a phone, that's not really so easy. There are fixes in things like Photoshop and PhotoP and uh, Pixlr to, to minimize this distortion, but it's very slight and it's probably not worth all the trouble you'd have to go to. So I, I would say, unless the distortion is really noticeable, I'd just skip it. And that's how you do it. Um, copying old photos is really important, right? You've got old photos that people, uh, people want to share and old photos get, you know, in bad shape. And it would be really nice to have in this digital age, a digital copy. Um, artwork, of course, either for, you know, to put up on the web or to send a copy to somebody, or in our case, to turn it in, um, or documents that you might need to photograph for whatever reason. That's how you photograph artwork, documents, and photographs. Have a great one.